Thank you for watching video from One Church of High Point. We hope that today's message encourages you to connect to God, to others, and to your purpose. If you're looking for more information about One Church or for more resources, visit onechurchnc.net. That's all right. Come on now. Yes, yes, yes. That was good. That was good. We can take up another offering. Amen. <laughs> I'm just joking. Oh, some of y'all Baptists for, oh, we got, we do that here? No, no, we don't. We don't. We don't. So last week, we lifted up a passage of scripture that I saw it differently last week. And we have a baby smuggler here. It's okay. Security, security. <laughs> last week, we came out of um, Second Chronicles. I believe it's chapter 20. And we lifted up a, a piece of passage in, in verse 18, 19, and 21. But I want to just highlight chapter, verse 21 real quick because this is what scripture tells us. It says this. And when he had consulted with the people, he had appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of holiness. And as they went out before the army, they were saying, praise the Lord, for his mercy endures forever. Now when they began to sing to the praise of the Lord, it says this in the scriptures, that the Lord set an ambush against their adversaries. I never saw that before. And so we always, you know, there's preacher, what we call cliches, and, you know, we know how to kind of prompt the audience to say, you know, we can say certain things. But this, you know, it's, we always say your, your, your praise is your weapon. Your worship is your weapon. And so when we say your worship is, is your weapon, you have context to back that up now. Come on, church. I need you to understand that your worship is truly your weapon. And it's in scripture. It says here in, in 2 Chronicles, it said that when the people came together as one. It didn't say just a group of them. It says when all of them told us, right? Come on, people. Told those. That too. All of them. Appreciate you. It says when all of them came together and worshiped God. Our Lord and our Savior set an ambush for the adversary. And on the other side, we came out victorious. And so what, there's power in our worship. I need you to understand, there's power in your personal worship. So if you're going through a, a battle in your life right now, just know, just fall on your knees and worship God. You don't need no music. You can sing to yourself. You can be all out of tune and all of that. Just worship God for what you know. Make up a song. Tap your knee. Slap your neighbor. Whatever you got to do, worship God to get victory. Because today, I choose, you choose, worship instead of worrying. I want to just highlight what we talked about last week. Last week, we talked about today we choose worship over worry because truth be told either you're one of three people either you in the fight for your life right now you just came out of it or you're going into it either you're in it you're coming out or you're going to so you're one of those three but what you need to know is that your worship is your weapon and we talked about what do you do when you begin to ask God that you have more questions than the answers, right? We've been there before where you begin to ask God that, God, why, how, when? What do you do when you have more questions than you have answers? And I'm reminded of Mark chapter 9 and just kind of setting the pace for today. Mark chapter 9 talks about a father whose son has been possessed since childhood. And the demons that was in his body, the spirits that was in his body, kept throwing him into the flames and taking him out again. And the father couldn't do anything. So 
This father encounters our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ, in 33 years as he's walking. One of those 33 years, actually three years in his ministry, he encounters this man. Jesus asked him a question. And he asked this. How long has this boy been like this? He says, from childhood, he answered. Has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us. God, if you can do anything, take pity on me. God, I know that you created the heavens and the earth, but whatever you can do, can you please take pity on me? Now I'm interceding on behalf of my child, my firstborn son, my only son. God, if you can do anything, take pity on us. Then he says this, everything is possible for the one who believes. Everything is possible for the one who believes. He didn't say some things. He didn't say some things on Sunday, you know, come to me on Sunday and I will, I will make those, those things take place for you. But he said everything, that's 24-7, 365 days out the year, everything is possible for the one who believes. And this is, what, this is what messes me up in the gospel. The father says this. Jesus, my God, my Lord, my Savior, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. God, I, I do believe, but there's, there's a segment, there's a portion of me, God, that says, I, I don't believe. Have you been there before? Like, God, I, I, I think I believe, but God, help my unbelief. See, on one hand, I have belief. And then on the other side, I have unbelief. See, on one hand, I, I'm walking in faith. But on the other side, I'm walking in fear. So there's somewhere in the middle that God wants you to say, God, either way that you have faith or fear, or even though that you have belief or unbelief, keep walking. Have you been there before? Have you been there before asking God, what shall I do? God, help my son. Can you heal him? God, help my unbelief. See, oftentimes as believers, we are, we're told that if you are a Christian, that you're not supposed to have fear. You're not supposed to have unbelief. But I want to just let you know that it's okay, that they can, they can reside in the same house. They can live in the same house. That you as a believer, as a Christian, can have both, and it's okay. But how did you get there? Well, how did you get there where you had faith and fear? How did you get there where you had unbelief and belief? I'll tell you this. And my experiences in life has caused me to have some doubts. My experiences in the church has caused me to have some unbelief. My experiences walking out of this, this thing that we call Christianity has caused me to begin to question God when I, when I don't know when or where he's going to how to deliver me from what this evil that I'm sitting in. There's some things that has challenged my faith. We still have some doubts. We still may have some struggles. You may be asking God, what do you want me to do? For some of us, you're just tired. For some of us, we're just, we're tired and we're ready to throw in the towel. But God is telling you today, don't quit. God is telling you today, don't quit. See, the Carolina boys, they played yesterday, right? And they didn't quit. Quarter one, quarter two, quarter three. Even though they, that they lost, they, they stayed in the game. They kept pushing through. They did not quit. And so my prayer for you today is this. I pray that God's give you strength in your struggle. Peace in your pain. And victory in your valley. 
my prayer for you today is that God would give you strength in your struggle, peace in your pain, and victory in your valley. Our scripture today, our focus is very simple. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. It says this. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at a proper time, we will reap a harvest. If we don't give up. Let, let me just read that one more time. Let us not grow weary. Let us not grow tired. Let us not tap out in doing good. For in a proper time, we will. Not that we might or is possible. No, it is a guaranteed promise. It's a guaranteed promise that God is saying we will reap a harvest if you don't give up. God is saying to you today, don't quit. God is saying, stay in the fight. God is saying, keep moving. God is telling you to remember Galatians chapter 6 verse 9 as Paul is writing to the church of Galatians, keep moving forward. I'm reminded of a story in the 1800s where we were building in the United States the Transcontinental Railroad, Railroad, and it basically sounds like it is. It was going from coast to coast, right? And the idea wanted to kick off this the railroad by driving the first spike. That's kind of like a, a hallmark event where we get to drive the first spike to say this is where we started. But one of the owners said, you know what, he did not want to participate in driving the first spike. And you may be asking why. And the owner said this. He says, if you want to gather a crowd and drive, to drive the first spike, that's fine. You can do that, but I won't be there. He said, I, I would not participate. He says, because over the next few months, over the next few years, the work is going to be difficult. The work is going to be hard. It's going to be treacherous. You're going to be going through rivers and mountains and, and building bridges, but if you want to be there for the first spike, you can do that. But what I would prefer to do is to be there at the last spike. Because we know that there will be a lot of work ahead of us, but it's easy to start something, but it's more important than when we finish. So he doesn't want to be there for the first spike. He said, you know what, call me when we drive the last spike. Because starting is easy. Anyone can start. But not everyone finish. Easy, it's easy to start, but not everyone finish. So, we don't want to grow weary in well-doing. We want to continue to persevere, to press in that starting is easy, but finishing is where most, where the challenge lies. And Paul is writing to the church to remind them, don't grow weary in well-doing. But in a proper time, in that season where God says it's time, you will reap a harvest if you don't give up. And I believe right now that God is speaking. He's whispering in someone's ear. He's telling you, don't give up. That God is, is bending down and he's, he's getting close and he said, don't give up. He says, my child. All those other voices that you hear, he's saying, don't give up. He is telling you to stay in the fight. Galatians 6 and 9, for me, I, I believe is, is more important than Romans chapter 8, verse 28, which tells us that God works everything for those to good, for those who love him, who has been called according to his, his purpose. Galatians chapter 6 and 9 is, is more important to me than Psalms 27 verse 1. It says that the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear that the Lord is my strength? 
See, Galatians 6 and 9 for me right now is more important than Isaiah 40, 31. For those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up upon wings like eagles, and they shall run and not grow. Those, for me, Galatians 6 and 9 is more important than those scriptures because he's telling us, he's reminding us not to give up. See, we're in a victory series, and we, we can't talk about victory if, you, if you're out of the fight. So I want to remind you today that you have to stay in the fight, that you have to continue to press in. You have to press towards the mark which you are called according to Christ Jesus, that God is telling you, don't give up. Because your yes, your yes is too important. Your yes is connected to somebody. See, your yes has kingdom effect. God is saying, don't give up. That you can't quit, that you can't give in, that you need to press in, that you need to stay the course, that you need to stay in the faith. See, it's easy for followers to follow Jesus to become discouraged. Life can beat us down sometimes. Many of us, some of us, if not all of us, we came out of our mother's womb fighting. We're fighting right now. We're fighting our bosses and our jobs. You're fighting your neighbors. You're fighting your coworkers. You're fighting your mother. You're fighting your father. You may be fighting your husband. You may be fighting your wife. But God is saying, don't give up. Some of you are, are fighting your health, health conditions, but God is saying, don't give up. Some of you are in the fight of your life. God is saying, don't grow weary in doing good because your yes is connected to the kingdom. Your yes has kingdom multiplication. Your yes is what God needs you. Three points in three minutes, and we're going to be done. Three plus minutes. Point number one. Believe in doing good. Believe in doing good. See, Paul in Galatians chapter 6 is urging his readers not to lose heart, not to grow weary in doing good. See, in the previous chapter, chapter 5, Paul began to outline what that good is. He began to outline that you should love your neighbor. That's good. Amen. He, he's, he's reminding the church that we should walk in the spirit and not gratify the desires of our flesh. That's the good that Paul is talking about. Paul is telling us that we should keep in step with the spirit. That is the good that God, that Paul is talking about. Let us not to become conceited or provoking with envy with each other. Paul is talking about in, in Galatians chapter 5 that, you know, we should have the fruit of the spirit, not the spirit, the fruits of the spirit. He says the fruit, singular. Even though that we call off love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That is the good that Paul is talking about. That's the good that he's encouraging one another. Paul is asking and encouraging that we apply what we just read. Paul is saying that are you walking in the fruit of the spirit? Are you walking in love? Are you walking in joy? Are you walking in peace? Are you walking in long suffering? Long suffering is, that's painful. Come on now, long suffering, you mean I, got, I have to suffer long? Paul, can you write long, short suffering? Can, can you? <laughs> when I get to heaven, I'm like, bro, what, what happened? Can you do short suffering versus long suffering? He says, no. Because the testing of your faith produces, right? See, many of us don't want to be tested. You know, growing up, um, this generation, man, y'all got it made, especially if you're a student. They have all these apps, parents, I don't know if you know that, they can go online and get all the answers that they want. All the answers. But y'all didn't know, my generation made it up. We did that. See, in my generation, 
All of our answers was in the back of the book. <laughs> Y'all remember that? Y'all remember when we can flip to the back of the book and get all the answers? Somebody says something, but oh, amen. Oh, only the odd numbers. That was in the south, but you lived up north. We had all of them, amen. <laughs> Y'all know I'm from New York. Come on now. I'm a Yankee all day long, but I like some sweet tea, amen. All of the answers were in the back of the book. And we have that same advantage today. All of the answers that we seek is in the book. All of the answers that you desire is in the book. So when you're seeking and you're looking and you're trying to, trying to figure out what life has, it's in the book. But y'all know what I say. Dusty Bibles, dirty Christians. If you dusty and crusty, it's probably because you, your Bible is dirty. Well, vice versa, same thing. <laughs> what God wants you to do is to walk in the spirit, to fully believe in doing good. And I get it. When we're talking about doing good, sometimes we get tired of doing good because he tells us, right, in verse 9, let us not grow tired, let us not grow weary. Sometimes I just, like, I don't want to do good. Can I just be honest? I say what you want to say. Sometimes you, you just, you just want to, like, just go off script sometimes, right? Like, because your flesh loves it. But that is not what God wants us to do. God wants you to believe in doing good. He also wants you to believe in the harvest. He tells us in Galatians 6, 9, he says this, let us not grow weary in well-doing. And in just the right time, in just the due season, you shall reap a harvest. You shall reap a harvest. See, a harvest is just not one apple. A harvest is just not one bushel of corn or whatever it may be. A harvest is plenty. Not just for you, but for your families. And I began to look at that. While it might seem that God isn't working to produce much fruit, the reality is that he's already working behind the scenes. God is working on your behalf. God is working through what you are praying for him to do to meet the needs in your life as long as you align, align, align yourself with God. And I begin to look at before the harvest, there has to be a seed. Before any harvest, there has to be a seed. A seed has to be placed and buried intentionally. A seed is buried intentionally in a place that's unfamiliar to itself. Is put into dirt, into soil, right? It's unfamiliar. It's dark. It's cold. It's pressed on every side. Take that seed in an unfamiliar place where it's dark, where it's cold, where it's unfamiliar, where it's pressed on every side. And the only way that it can be produced in a harvest is the outer, outer core is broken. There's a breaking of the shell to produce the harvest that we need. If y'all get it, I don't have to preach as long. Come on now. <laughs> so what God is saying is this. For you who are weary and tired, that right time to get to the harvest Sometimes God has to put, a, put you in a place that's unfamiliar. Sometimes God has to put you in a place that's cold. Sometimes God has to put you in a place that's dark. Sometimes God may have to put you in a situation where you're pressed on every side. So that way there's a breaking taking place within you. 
don't get up, don't give up just yet, don't quit. Because it's in the pressing, it's in the breaking, it's in the coldness, it's in the dark where the harvest that God wants out of your life will come from. If God takes that much intentionality for a seed, don't you think he would take even more intentionality with you? If God puts that much emphasis in making sure that there's a harvest come from a seed, we are his greatest creation. You have to know that he would take just, if not more time with you to make sure that you produce a harvest that glorifies him. It takes time to develop a, Christ, a Christ-like character. It takes time to grow a healthy church. It takes time to build a mature relationship. It takes time to raise kids. It takes time to establish a productive career. It takes time to move where God has called you to be. So there's a harvest that God wants to come out of the seeds that you're planting. And you may not believe that God is growing something inside of you. You may not believe that God is saying, you may be saying, God, I'm, I'm, I'm damaged goods. How can my track worker produce something that you can use? He said, because I created you. I know who you are. I created you with a purpose. Even when you're damaged, I can re, reshape and refashion. I can put you back on the potter's wheel so that way I can begin to shape you and mold you in such a way that I can, you can be used for my glory. Point number three is this. We believe in the harvest. We believe in God doing good. And the last one, you have to believe in his outcome. You have to believe in God's outcome. You mean to tell me, God, that all things through Christ strengthens me? Yes. God, you mean he tells me that if I'm washed by the blood, I have victory? Yes. God, you mean to tell me that I have victory because I'm blessed and high, highly favored? Yes. God, you mean to tell me that the steps of a righteous man are ordered? That means I have victory? Yes. God, you mean to tell me that no weapons formed against me shall prosper? It means I have victory? Yes. God, you mean to tell me that if I'm Christ's workmanship, that I have victory? Yes. God, you mean to tell me that greater is he that's in me, that's in, that's in the world? Yes, that means you have victory. God, you mean to tell me that I have victory because nothing shall separate me from the love of Christ? That means I have victory? Yes. So let us not grow weary in doing well because in just the right time, We shall reap a harvest if, if we don't quit. So as our worship team make their way to the stage today, I just want to encourage somebody today. You may be at the last breaking point of your life. You may be like, God, I'm ready just to throw in the towel. Life is having its way with me. Things are not lining up. Truth be told, all hell may be breaking out in your life right now, contextually speaking. And God is saying, Don't grow weary in doing well. Because in a due season, you will reap a harvest. Don't grow weary in this season of your life. Because in a due season, you will reap a harvest. I want to remind you today that you have victory. You have victory because of the person that you're connected to. 
You have victory because who you believe your life for. You have victory because the blood that was shed on your life, the blood that was shed on the cross at Calvary, you have victory because the blood that was shed more than 2,000 years ago covers you today, and you have victory. I get it. We're all tired, but we got to stay in the fight. We've been fighting for our lives. We've been fighting day after day, but God is saying, don't quit. God is telling you, don't quit today. Stay in the fight. And the posture that God wants you to have is this. He wants you to proclaim and know that it is well with my soul. Because if it's well with your soul, you're giving God all the glory and the honor. He said, God, I trust you with my life. I trust you with my circumstances. I, church, I trust you with my situation. And God, whatever that you have prescribed for me in this season of my life, it is well with my soul. And I want you just to hear these words. It says, it's peace like a river. Attend my way that sorrows like sea, billows roll. It says that it is well with my soul. It says, though, though Satan may buffet me, though trials may come, bless assurance control that God, it is well with my soul. Can I get some it is well with my soul folks in here today? Can I get some people that will proclaim that, God, whatever comes my way, it is well with my soul. God, my bank accounts may be negative zeros, but it is well with my soul. God, I may be driving on three wheels and, and a busted tire. God, it is well with my soul. God, whatever it may be in my life, God, it is well with my soul. Affliction may come. Sickness may come. But, God, this is on this side of heaven. But I know when I get to the other side of heaven, it is well with my soul because I will be before my maker and my creator. It is well with my soul. So God, whatever comes at me today, I know that we are more than conquerors because we have victory in Jesus. Thank you for watching today's video. If you made a commitment of any kind or you made a first time decision to accept Christ, we want to hear from you. Email us at info at onechurchnc.net. If today's message encouraged you, we want to encourage you to give so that we can continue to share the hope of Jesus. You can do that by visiting onechurchnc.net slash give.